Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. This is a very special moment always, and I'd um, like to really uh, give a warm welcome to all our colleagues, all the faculty members and academic leaders of Laureate that are joining us in this webinar. A uh, special welcome to our teams in Australia and also Walden in the US, but also to our teams in Europe and Latin America for uh, being with us today. I am um, just doing this with this uh, fantastic technology that we've been using for our webinars and for our um, faculty and academic leadership development plan. And it's uh, truly a very good technology to get to you in anywhere. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really um, amazing that we can do this. And then you can actually share with colleagues of other people that can access through the same link and access this uh, same webinar in the future. We have had incredible success in, in training and developing our faculty members and leaders with this tool. Obviously, there are components of the program that are on site that cannot be substituted, but as long as we can reach you online, it's just so much better and more efficient to get to you and, and, and share some of this good information. I wanna thank you for the time that you're dedicating to this, and I know you're excited about the other phases of the, of the program, of the faculty program, but I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the entire health sciences team really for uh, preparing for this session. And it's really the entire file team from, uh, from all over the world that is working on, on all these programs, man, are doing an amazing job. I know we have all this week, the Spanish webinars. Next week, we have the Portuguese webinars. But this is a special occasion where I like to speak in English and actually uh, share with you some of the general areas of LLM uh, for people that then later will go through um, the introductory level, the uh, instructor level, then the uh, designer level, which is the level we're reaching this year. So I'm, again, I'm very excited. I'm thank, thanking uh, you again for, for joining us today. And I'm gonna uh, start my presentation by again, uh, saying that this is, this is about an introduction to the Laureate Learning Model. For some of you that have um, heard me before speaking about LLM, you know, I, I, I love to say that the LLM changes every day, you know, as we discover new things, as we learn from best practices from our uh, universities, as we bring some of the good uh, things happening, you know, the LLM changes and improves. So as we have always said, this is an open system. It's an open environment for, um, for growth. And none, I, I don't believe, and, and some of my colleagues don't let me uh, lie about this, I don't believe that the LLM is the same as it was five years ago, or three years ago, or even last year. We have really done a lot of good things. And um, today I wanna take the opportunity to go over all the components in the next 50 minutes or so, have an opportunity for you to have questions about it. And, and perhaps uh, also uh, make sure that uh, we hear you through our registration process. So at the end of the presentation, there will be a form that you can scan with your cell phone and just capture the QR code and you can register. And actually um, we captured your registration and a small evaluation. So uh, we can use them for certification and other purposes. I also have a wonderful help, you know, uh, Manuela Malta and Vivian Silva, who are uh, some of our academic experts. You know, uh, Vivian is in Brazil. She's the national leader for structure and function. And Manuela is um, uh, the, the global director for education and products. They, will, they, they both will be helping with answering some of your questions in case, in case, in case they come very fast. They're, they are online helping me with some of the questions, but, I'll be happy to take some of them. And thank you, Gracia, for all your help coordinating everything about the logistics and technology for this webinar today. So I really have two pieces of this presentation. 
One is really an introduction of ELLM, but also talking a little bit about the origins and the pedagogical basis. Something that we, we really didn't start LLM with a pedagogical basis. We just knew we were using best practices to create it, but we started building the pedagogical uh, conceptual base later as we uh, got uh, more busy and deeper into the model. So I wanna talk to you about some of these uh, findings and what are the basis of this, which are always a requirement as we run our universities in any part of the world. And also very briefly talk about the components and methodology in the LLM. Although I wanna say that as you know, in our program for development, each one of the components, uh, the four main components has uh, an, an introductory uh, piece at instructor level, designer level, advisor and expert level. So I'm just touching on the surface. And really on the introduction, when I talk about some of the health trends, because one of the reasons uh, for the LLM, it's really what's happening in health, in healthcare, in public health. If, if health and healthcare is changing and will be different 20 years from now, then our educational model necessarily needs to look at that. If the health systems are, uh, are changing too and are finding better ways to deliver care at all levels, our educational system needs to change. So part of the reason for LLM is what's happening in health. And as you see in this slide, you know, there are the, the, on, on, the, on the lower left, the health focus priorities. You know, what's, what's the focus? This is not a presentation on public health, but we are all health pro professionals. And we know that these health priorities on the left, the aging of the population, the importance of community and family, everything that is happening in behavior and lifestyle, all the issues with chronic and disability care, the need and the importance of physical activity, leisure and food as components of health, and also technology, the rising cost and the failure of systems. No health system is perfect. Um, are important priorities in any health system around the world, but also how the shift in location of care, how we're moving away somehow in the hospital care to different spaces. So all of those health focus priorities are necessarily influencing the way we educate the health professionals. We are also very familiar with some of the health workforce needs. These workforce needs are evidently uh, uh, driven especially by the need for more. We have shortages of workers in health in many countries, I would say in most countries, they vary. You know, some of them are technical, some of them are professional, some of them are specialty gaps. But I would say that I don't know any country that doesn't have some form of a gap in any uh, health profession. So we have, uh, uh, and in many countries, they just need a large number of additional professionals. And these professionals, these workers, or this workforce in health needs also to be adaptable because of the, the lack of other professionals, some substitute others. So this adaptability need is also important when you create an educational model. This incredible, incredibly important to culture for interprofessional care, which has been an issue of you know, rising over the last five to eight years, where people are talking more about this importance of taking the, uh, creating a culture for interprofessional and definitely this idea of other places for care, not necessarily a healthcare environment, maybe the house, maybe just the community, and maybe just spaces for health where, where the care happens. You know, so ideally we would design a learning model that applies to all these things, but at the same time that produces a health professional, a health worker, a health technician, depends what we're talking about a postgraduate degree, you know, that is flexible because of these needs, we necessarily need to produce health professionals that are flexible so they can adapt and meet the needs of the populations or the communities. We also focus very strong on employability. Employability is no guarantee. We know it's very strong in health. It's a very um, large piece of the economy and largely employable, but not necessarily. 
a, best, a better graduate means better employability. We talk about this cross-skilling, the ability to do more things when you're in the care setting, whether it's a nurse, a speech therapist, a physical therapist, a dentist, you know, the ability to go beyond your own profession and actually do things that cross your skills so you can be uh, more effective. We, we again remind of the skills for interprofessional, an incredible need for age and chronic care focus, the importance of technology, and obviously something we talk a lot about it, but sometimes we do little about it in the education of the professionals, which is this idea of wellness and prevention. Wellness and prevention, we abuse the use of the words. We don't really use it a lot to prepare our professionals Sometimes they're not completely ready to enter this wellness and prevention need and, and importance in, in our society today. We have to take into the consideration the determinants of health, this famous chart, you know, where you talk about the several factors that combine to determine our health. And we see the influence of behavior and lifestyle. So it's not necessarily that we don't I mean, we just want to have a course on behavior or a course on lifestyle. We need to embed it throughout the curriculum and embed it in the, you know, the, the learning outcomes and the competence of a professional. Otherwise, we will be missing 40% of the determinants of health. Genetics too, 30%. We may or may not be able to do much with genetic changes, you know, but we still need to know that that's an important component on learning and hopefully in the future, more to do to determine the health, working with, with the genetic uh, of populations. There's also 20% of environmental and social factors, never strong enough in our curriculums, you know. Again, look at the 40 and the behavioral and 20 in the environmental and social factors. That's 60%. It's important. They determine the health of the people. We will leave only 10% to the actual care of the population. So if we focus too much, if our model didn't consider all these factors, the environmental, the behavioral, the lifestyle, the social, and even the genetics, we will leave only a professional that can determine the health of the future populations only by affecting 10% of this. So very important chart that actually justify a lot of the factors that are embedded in our learning model and eventually reflect in our curriculums. All this medical technology news, you know, we see artificial intelligence substituting and improving the way we actually diagnose these diseases. You know, whether it's retinal exams, whether it's x-rays, you know, all this influence of the, the technology of artificial intelligence, the microchips embedded anywhere that can monitor chronic conditions, everything that is happening in the area of CRISPR technologies and other genetic modifications and all this uh, new uh, uh, overwhelming information on the genetic code and everything that we're doing there for disease uh, prevention and treatment. Important too, we have there a, a picture of uh, the first um, virtual hospital in uh, Mercy in the United States, where we see now a full hospital without um, Without a, a bed, without a patient admitted, you know, it's all virtual. It's very, it's doing, uh, it's challenging during our view. And finally, we see the influence of augmented reality and virtual reality to help with patients, like in this case, the example that we have there. All these trends in medical technology, of course, they will influence our academic model and our our curriculums for the future. Here's an example. This is the operating room of the future. Very interesting, you know, and let's talk about the, the lighting and the materials and the, the changes in, uh, again, flexibility. So you can do so many things in a new surgical room. Why is this important? Why is this important is, is something that uh, some of my colleagues in Australia uh, and I, you know, share in, in our recent visit where we saw this technological digital divide. If you see this picture, of the operating room of today, and you count the number of computers and displays in this picture, you realize that we cannot afford to have 
a digital divide in our future professionals or healthcare workers because nobody else, there won't be an, if, uh, an IT person coming into the operating room to fix this, the, the, the computers or the displays that are not working. We must make sure that our future professionals and workers are completely familiar and comfortable manage, managing this in, in, in influence and influx of digital information coming to the care environment. This is an operating room. And I think you're seeing here 20 or 25 computers. But if we see it in the emergency room, we see the same things. Just visit one of your hospitals, you'll see it. Just even in the regular bed, the beds now have displays and computers embedded. So very important to consider technology when we talk about an academic model. We see this two covers that are very impactful, you know, the new phase of aging. It's no longer uh, longevity. It's about what are these uh, people living to 80s and 90s and 100? Uh, one thing in terms of diet, mood, physical activity, you know, a baby that can live 142 years old, what does that mean for us as health professionals, uh, educators, you know? How do we gonna face these things? Not only again, extending life, but improving life and making it functionally uh, maximized. You know, how do people continue to have physical activity, good nutrition, and actually a good mental health? Very important trend. We also see the rise of alternative medicine, alternative and complementary. The global growth of its usage you know, almost two thirds of adults, 50 and older, use some form of complementary and alternative medicine. But the important thing is less than one third who uses this technology, these, these, these alternatives, talk about it with their healthcare providers. So our healthcare technicians, our healthcare professional must have the sensitivity to understand and actually be familiar with these alternative medicine um, systems whether they work better or they're still improving, we need to learn and we need to make sure they're included. Otherwise, you're gonna have in front of you a patient that most probably has used one of these systems. Here's another important part. This is what we call the wellness and physical activity market. You know, I'm, I'm presenting here the 3 trillion US total health sector. It's enormous. It's actually too big and too costly. So it's about, again, three trillion US dollars. But even if you separate this, this thing that you see on the right, the $267 billion of what they call the wellness and physical activity market. These are patients using functional beverages, nutrition and energy bars, gym memberships, personal trainers, yoga, boxing gyms, you name it, these changing things as you can see in our societies today. You know, emerging economies, rich countries, poor countries, all are into this. An enormous piece of the economy, an enormous piece of the health sector that we must make sure that our professionals actually address correctly and are absolutely familiar with, um, with this and actually can manage. Not only because of that, because this also represents uh, either entrepreneurial, or actual employment opportunities for some of our graduates. We have an enormous amount of graduates in nutritional programs, in pharmacy, in, in areas that actually can benefit tremendously from some of these uh, extra spaces in the healthcare markets. Very important trend. We also must consider that the education process of a health sciences professional or worker, it doesn't start with the school where they, when they are coming to our institutes of universities. It actually starts usually before in high school on the previous year, before higher education, when they start developing early knowledge or actually interest. Then it goes through the health sciences school, whether it's a medical school or any other. It continues through residency, fellowship, internship, specialties. And actually, as you well know, it will be lifelong. There is no health health worker that can finish their education the moment they finish their education. So this is important when we design our model, you know, that we, we build the program 
for lifelong learning continuing education. And we don't just try to cram everything into that curriculum, but that we must develop the basis for this lifelong learning education from our institutions, you know, and don't just accumulate knowledge. Very important piece that influences the development of our model. So I would say to, to stop here for, uh, for, a, for a brief pause, that we have a learning model that intends to graduate a practice-ready health professional that is competent and prepared for lifelong learning. The methodologies and tools, they all come from some form of best practices. As I said, it's an evolving learning model. It's an educational strategy. It's something that we have brought. We have the fortune of being in so many countries that we learn from each other and we bring and enhance our system and our educational strategy. So we really have a model that has come from many, many best practices. And now it's truly a jewel for us as we manage the process in Laureate, as we manage its implementation in the different institutions. I'm going to make a brief pause, pause here and hopefully see if, um, if we have um, a few questions or, or if, uh, if my colleagues have helped me with, uh, with uh, some of the answers here. Um, let me see. Uh, I'm not getting the, um, the, the, the no questions. Great. OK, so I think we're just going to um, continue. Uh, with, with the, the presentation. Um, and again, you can use the chat for uh, the questions. It's, if you have a Gmail account, you can be signed in and then you can actually uh, ask questions or leave some comments in the chat and we'll be happy to, to review them and, and, and try to answer if you have questions or, or make comments about what you, what you put in the chat. So feel free to put that throughout the presentation. So what's our, our ambition? Our ambition in Laureate Health Sciences is this, to improve access to quality higher education in health sciences around the globe and help address the healthcare workforce shortages. And we have an, a bigger goal. You know, when health improves, countries improve, people live longer and have better quality of life. All of these can be done with a good educational model. Therefore, we came up with this idea of a model, a learning model that can be used in any institution, whether it's a technical institute or a postgraduate institution that we have several, you know, where we're actually focusing a few methodologies that cover the majority of the curriculum and that intend the outcomes that are reflected on the right. And that will ideally make our institutions better, compete better, become better and actually graduate a better health professional. So I'm gonna briefly go over some of this. You know, we eventually think that by the application of these methodologies, we will achieve superiors to the outcomes. We will have the maximum level possible or intended of national and international accreditation. We will actually meet some of the internationally accepted competencies for the different professionals, which may vary from country to country but in reality, they are all very similar. A physical therapist that works in the United States will share, I would say 80 to 85% of the competencies of a physical therapist in Brazil or in Australia or in New Zealand or in any other profession. So I would actually say uh, that we will be pleased if we meet these international accepted competencies to the 90% level. And finally, we know that our health has an impact on the communities and on the society in general. So these five pieces of the model, pieces of the pie here, I will go quickly again, as I said, four of them are now being um, presented, you know, in, in special webinars and trainings in our institutions. I'm going to say a little bit about our pedagogical basis. You know, our pedagogical basis actually is very simple. This is what we borrow from one of our best practices, Peninsula Medical School in the United Kingdom. You know, when we started developing the model, we asked these very simple questions. How can the student learn better? So we put a white page and say, 
is the student learning better with these methodologies? So we focus on the student. What do, does the student need to know for practice? When they graduate as an, an entry level practitioner, remember that concept of lifelong learning. Our job is to get them to the entry level practitioner, not to the expert level. So when you think about that, you, your curriculum changes because you focus in exactly what they need to know for practice when they graduate, not as an expert. And a lot of things start falling down out of the curriculum that are really curriculums for specialists. So let's, let's, let's think about this because our, our learning model was created with this in mind. What are the tools available? Not only what's traditional, not only how we were educated in our profession, but what tools are available. Also, questioning things that are common and conventional in education. Do we really need that? What are they learning with this? If they have a microscope, if they have something that, what are, do, we, do we really need that? And when you start questioning that, your model starts taking shape and really you change and become um, an innovator. Uh, very important, this is a big piece, how to create an environment of learning. Can we create the laboratories or the digital space in a way that becomes engaging for, for learning? And finally, what is the emphasis? You know, if we're, we're graduating a health practitioner, we will have, to have a very different view of any knowledge field. You know, we want to have a very different view of the craft cycle. We're going to have a very different view of genetics because if we're graduating a nurse or we're graduating a nutritionist or we're graduating a psychologist, it's very different, the emphasis that we're going to give to the knowledge fields. From the beginning, we knew active learning was part of our model. And many of our schools have gained so much just by applying the concepts of active learning. Simply 50% more likely to fail in courses that do not have an active learning. You know, 35% lower. If the student is active compared to lecture, the student learns more. I know this sounds simple, but it's so critical because if you remember all the pieces of our pie, every single one demands active learning, whether it's simulation of, of interprofessional or, inter, or, or just the fact obviously structural and function, biological foundations where we're gaining more and more, you know, active learning is important and it's inside our pedagogical basis. This idea of a conceptual curriculum you know, this has evolved over the last few years. Wonderful publication here refer from a dentistry uh, curriculum expert. You know, we will continue to apply strong bases in the bottom. We want our students to have very strong foundations in biological sciences, but also in structure and function. We also want our students to have superb, strong knowledge in social and behavioral sciences. I don't have to repeat. It's 60% of the determinants of health. So we emphasize in our curriculums as we go from the bottom to the top, those things. And we start the foundation of patient care skills also from the beginning, an important contribution of our model. We start with simulation from the beginning. We're strong believers. We're pioneers in many countries in simulation. And we like the idea starting early so we can have our students applying foundations to patients that come from strong biology, strong structure and function, good social and behavioral knowledge, and strong foundations in patient care skills. And then we go up, increasing the complexity, getting from a system, whether it's three year, two year, four year degree, as they acquire you know, more competencies for clinical practice or professional practice. Always simulation, always testing, always Perform, supervising the performance and assessing. And then we move higher in the complexity level until the point where we have a realistic setting, a clinical setting, a professional setting, where we will actually evaluate the general competency of our graduate. Again, very simple pedagogical basis for our curriculums that actually um, create the basis for strong curriculums like we have today.
very important, integration and immersive learning. We are all familiar with the Spiral curriculum. And now, you know, there's no curriculum that we start today without looking at attitudes, knowledge and skills, without knowing that better understanding and retention of biomedical principles only come when we make this knowledge relevant to the students for their future practice. We reduce the repetition of content. We reinforce the learning through the spiral. We actually always believe, do the students see the application of this in biological foundations, in the structure and function, in the early clinical? Do they see why they need this? When we make it relevant, when we do not focus in knowledge that is never going to be useful, our model works. Our system begins to, to, to um, decrease things that were usually in a curriculum and no longer there because they become important for what is going to be useful for that future professional. A lot of it in, in reflecting our laboratories or our digital environments. Now we have our labs that can be actually online, but there are also our physical laboratories. And as you know, they look amazing. And many of them, you know, came from a very, very simple concepts from this Stanford project, the SMILE project, which is the medicine information learning environment when Stanford University changed the medical school curriculum. You know, they talk about this learning ecology. How can we immerse learning? How can we reduce the traditional lecture, introduce problems for learning, provoke this small group interaction, but at the same time, have the larger group available? How can we make a student visualize everything? How can we provide this emphasis in action? Have the student doing something, whether it's a wet dry lab or a dry lab. And how can we take advantage of these informal spaces for groups and for teams? You know, and then when you see this simple diagram now reflects in our wonderful laboratories, in all our institutions, we created this learning environment. Here is another example. When you enter, you know, Stanford talk about this learning ecology. And you see when you see a, a complex simulation of, uh, scenario being taking place, you know, you can have the, the, the high level scenario, but outside, you know, there may be a patient and the small groups that are discussing it or the debriefing being happening at a different part. The important thing is this conceptual idea of immersive learning be created in, in the laboratory. Here's another example, you know, again, what is happening in the cafeteria? What's happening in the atrium of the campuses? Can we create this flexible discussion? Can we stop seeing the professor speaking all the time and being the students really engaging in their own learning? And that is created through this information learning environment, through the labs, through the design, and our architects have played in it a fantastic role in helping us creating these roles. We also have emphasized academic documentation. We believe in this map, like it's so important, you know, for us. We think that going to the granular level will strengthen our learning model, not stopping at the competencies, not stopping at the curricular map. Usually we stop at the syllabus level, maybe the lesson plans, well, now we're going to the practice tools. And we have wonderful tutorials developed by our teams, started by our laureate institutions that are now perfect to document to the granular level. A good faculty member, well-trained with a good academic document, uh, uh, the project that we call HEGA, it, it secures, it, it, it increases the possibility that we are successful in the application of this uh, learning model. So the practice tools and the detailed granular documentation, it's important in our accredited model. And it's actually giving us a lot of rewards when the accreditors now come to our institutions and see that everything that we have really preached in our curriculums and our syllabus and our model and our training is reflected in academic documents. And it's really, uh, it's a demonstration that we're truthful in terms of the application of the model. Um, before I go into the uh, new structure and function and, and begin to really quickly go over this, I just want to make sure that uh, we don't have any, any questions or comments that we need to address. 
Let's see if there is anything. Give a minute. Okay, let's keep going then. I hope that we have some uh, of your comments later, please, because that will be fantastic for us to get uh, some of your feedback. Okay, so I'm going to go over the, the, the generalities of the model in terms of the different pieces of the pie. We talk about structure and function, big piece of that curriculum, whether it's anatomy, histology, embryology, or actually the biological foundations, which are embedded here, the biochemistry or the cell biology or the genetics. You know, we know here that the new technologies improve learning in all these areas. We know that, that with the time we have created 17 or more new tools to better teach in these areas for students to better learn. We have so many tools today. These are enhanced methods that use humane, realistic technologies for impact and for retention, where we think relevant comes from clinical or professional application. The student learns anatomy because it knows what it means for its future clinical practice, learns physiology in a different way. It's all integrated because it creates action, collaboration, and then amazing learning spaces. You know, we're no longer attached by this. I don't think we see this in many of our institutions. There may be a few remaining clouds, and that's just because of the regulators but we are far, so far away from this traditional learning or what was used to call basic sciences. You know, this was the past, the future. And this seems like an easy jump of slides, but it's really a great jump in terms of what we've achieved. We see our real students using different technologies, whether it's animals or humans, you know, in terms of using body projection, the use of text, the use of uh, models, and the interaction in small groups. We had a uh, wonderful interaction today in our structure and function um, designer level workshop, um, a webinar where we discuss all about this. The incredible contribution of applications and computers and software has brought all these marvelous technologies to a, to a tablet. You know, uh, the, the importance, I want to show one example later of how body projection is used to teach anatomy and physiology and how, how, in, how great it is when our students are playing with uh, developing the cerebral stem. You know, these are our medical students in Europe just doing, they're really playing, but play is an important part of learning. So it's part of our pedagogical basis that we want our students engaged in this playing. And as you see on the right, you know, we see students with multiple tools on the table discussing and trying to solve some of the questions for the learning. This is the list, an enormous contribution of you, our faculty members, our professors. You have brought living and surface anatomy to a new level. It used to be a few examples of body painting that we brought from Peninsula America School in the background there. But we actually have peer examination, a lot of work in body projection, live models, digital surface anatomy, incredible work in body radiology, uh, body plastics, you know, all these new things. Uh, medical images continue to play an important role. Uh, this is the anatomy that our students will see when they are in professional lives. Forever, they will look at medical images. So MRI, CT, ultrasound for sure, play an important role in teaching them anatomy. Surgery and endoscopy, what better than see real anatomy with a laparoscopic uh, surgery or an arthroscopy or a lower endoscopy or an upper endoscopy, we really see that the students can learn a lot of the basics of uh, the structure of the body through real live bodies being operated with a video of a, of a surgery. The artificial and virtual anatomies, the, model, the plastic models still play an important role. Sometimes they're less flexible, but the students like them. And actually, we think that they are, some of them are very realistic. They still play a very important role. They learn with the simulators too. And as I said, the software, the smartphone, the augmented reality, the virtual reality that we're seeing now, that we're putting in our campuses, it's really amazing. And finally, virtual experiments. A lot of good development there for biological foundations. 
based on the web, whether it's a power lab or similar technology, whether it's a digital simulation, obviously digital microscopy all play an important role as the basic set of methodologies. We see our students there with some of these tools, you know, some of them are really just simple, but look at that, their faces, their engagement, they're playful, but they're learning, they're engaged. Whether they're looking at images, they're looking at a physiological experiment with peer to peer, whether they're just doing the models, or actually doing a very serious class there with a, a surface anatomy and in the back, the body projection. This is, there's like four tools that are mixed there in that class on the lower left. And then some of our artists that are doing amazing work. And I know you guys love to, to, to share some of these body paintings. Some of them are incredible. Some of them have won awards because it's very impactful when a student sees the anatomy like that and that uh, actor or volunteer can stay with us for um, several hours. And the student can actually see movement, can see a student learning through real anatomy with a live person, with the variation and the diversity that can, diff can bring from different uh, players here. You know, some of the most dramatic here, you know, some of them are obviously things that we'll only be able to do through uh, digital technologies, but we're, we're getting very close to all of this. I know you, you, you've seen this, you know, some of these things, the virtual experiments, some of the wonderful work in, in realistic, whether it's body painting, body projection, the use of the virtual microscope. We're so happy to see these micro, microscopes in the bottom. They're computers. They're students learning the importance of histology, but learning without the need to actually spend time making sure that the microscope works. So for our medical, nursing, nutrition, psychology students, this is good enough and actually better than spending time in things, as I said, that are really not necessary for our model. And then we have the very cool tools and technologies, the big uh, screens that let us do virtual dissection. And students just love these technologies. You know, you see some others more, you see a normal shoulder diagnostic arthroscopy how much you can show the real anatomy of, of, a, of a person, you know? Before, we used to do either really just not helpful cadaveric dissection that wouldn't really find any of the joints or ligaments or tendons anymore. We just figured out they were there. But now we can teach the student with an arthroscopy uh, real anatomy. Or look at the students, how engaged they look in that body projection. Some of the playful things again, virtual sniffy for uh, psychology students learning some of the basics of behavior or some of the basis too of uh, drugs interaction with mouse party. You know, and every day more and more tools are being available. I like, I like uh, uh, here, you know, showing some of the wonderful use of the ultrasound, for example, you know, what else our medical students using ultrasound from their first day in school to learn anatomy I think that just creates a better professional from day one, you know, or the professors now with pure technology. Imagine our students, I don't have to say, our students will not learn unless technology is involved. And I think we see here a wonderful example of this immersive technology. I like this example because it summarizes some of the work, the early work at the Morumbi in Brazil with, uh, uh, with some of our technologies. This is a beautiful video that brings the technology of body painting, body projection, I'm gonna to show to you. this example because it shows first at the end you see in the video all the engagement of our students how much they're learning you know this was a beautiful combination really is artistry and good teaching you know how we got to a point where we use body projection body painting 
the, the wonderful work of a volunteer and an, and an artist that really came to this and, um, and became, you know, a reality. The students, how can you say that the students don't love these type of classes and really become very, uh, very, uh, very good followers of our academic model? So let me talk a little bit about systems integration and interprofessional education. Very important piece, you know. We have curriculums, I would say 95% that are organs and systems based, no longer disciplinary curriculums, with a few exceptions, you know. We are, we have curriculums that actually integrate biological, behavioral, and social determinants of health because they are central in the formation of the professionals. We, we remind everyone that the new biology, not the old biology, remains paramount in learning, and that the activities must be relevant and learned in a context of professional practice. And we use methodologies that actually increase knowledge retention. And of course, that we think and do interprofessional, like that background, beautiful picture in the back of that slide. The pedagogical basis, simple. Vertical, compartmentalized systems of knowledge are only for novices. We are actually creating a health professional. We need expert knowledge. We actually need that horizontal network interaction. We need actually to make sure the students go through and link. They don't have to go through all the anatomy, all the physiology, all the histology. They learn a little bit of, uh, of uh, pharma and then learn some clinics to finally see a patient. We need to connect these dots and stay away from this smokestack curriculum, really come to a network curriculum so they can learn better. And that came reflected into our curricular blocks, curricular blocks that are our integration. You know, our professors no longer belong to the Department of Anatomy. They actually may be as uh, part of the the curriculum of structure and function, of the group of structure and function, or biological foundations, where they share with the different professionals, with, with the way they share with other, uh, other uh, faculty members that are teaching the same things. And we hope that all of them become, this is a less crowded field of departments and turfs and separation, fragmentation, to come together where these blocks put a professor in each block give a professor a house to work in each block and actually give the knowledge space in each of these houses so we can be better integrated. And this is reflected when we create our wonderful new courses. How can we call this biological process? How will we say aggression and defense mechanisms? We were so much criticized in the beginning by this, but now we, don't, we can go back. You know, just our faculty members, our professors know that the best way to teach microbiology, pathology, parasitology, immunology, it's together in a system that teaches really grouping. The grouping is relevant to a knowledge area. If we're going to know about pharmacology, we better know it learning in the context of this therapeutic effect. So this is the integration of disciplines expressed in the way a course is created and a very, very important part of our learning model. And then obviously this emphasis on interprofessional. We are very fortunate to have experts in our teams that are experts in interprofessional care. And they are very active in publishing and creating these frameworks for action. We need to make sure that the students work together so they can work together as health professionals. And that makes it part, unless you put this into the lesson plans, into the curriculums, into the actual practices and the design of practice tools, we won't be able to create these interprofessional environments where the students actually work together. Let me talk about simulation. Simulation, it's more glamorous in our learning model. It's something that started to pick up really fast, but let's be honest we were some of the first to really pick it up. And it's no longer only about having simulators, but it's really having simulation in the way we teach and learn in our schools. There's solid evidence of the effectiveness of training of health professionals. We know about the ethical training, the reduced risk, the increase in safety. 
You know, we know how it's important for the students to train skills for the possibility of repeating something because it doesn't hurt a patient, because it allows us to do soft skills, leadership, decision making, teamwork, all those things. How can they access some common cases? How can they get immersed into an environment before they are in the real environment? They are in a realistic environment. The clinical skills are done then in a supervised setting and that came with simulation. We have evolved so much. This is a changing field. We actually know, some of my colleagues will agree with me. We know there is now in the world traditional simulation that we don't want, we don't want to do. We have moved so fast in this field. We're so advanced. We have so many good people in simulation today. We're now more in the consensus of having these different techniques, whether it's an isolated task training, an integrated task training, a simulation scenario, whether it's interprofessional or we use one of our wonderful assessment methodologies, OSCE or OSPI. In Laureate, we don't talk about fidelity anymore. We don't talk about complexity. We try to talk about these six techniques. The resources can be virtual, can be a standardized patient, can be a mannequin. In the beginning, as I said, there were only mannequins. Today, the mannequin is just one of our tools. Sometimes it's used, sometimes we don't need it. Sometimes it's actually not the right thing to have. So as the other schools and the competitors move into uh, a chase for more simulators, we move into an advanced level of better simulation as a way of learning. And here it is, you know, we go a few examples from our network, whether it's a simple task trainer to a complex scenario where we actually do um, everything, you know, that a patient can have and can involve the family members, can involve different health professions. When we have a standardized patient on the right, you know, just discussing some issues and psychological issues, or we move into the high technology, the haptic devices, the wonderful space of, of uh, working with uh, machines and virtual reality uh, with our wonderful Molash experts now we're publishing on Molash. We're so proud of the team that is publishing now on Molash training, you know, how to do these realistic spaces so the students can have the opportunity of reducing stress and getting more comfortable taking care of these patients. The, the, the hybrid simulation, half actor, half mannequin for, for delivery. We have wonderful midwifery, obstetrics now, graduates, that have done everything in a simulated environment and can go out and take care of many patients because they have done all sorts of cases in a simulated environment. We were one of the first movers in veterinary medicine. I'm always very proud of that when we said, well, if we're doing it in everything and we have so many wonderful veterinary schools in Laureate, why not get into simulation and be the first? And we actually consider one of the pioneers in simulation and veterinary I've seen about 80 different simulations in, in veterinary. Thank you to our teams. Thank you to the great involvement of faculty members that have innovated and really learned from others. You see the dentistry there. We see the disaster management, the trauma cases. These cases are amazing. They are testimonies of the creativity of our faculty members. When you see cases like the ones on the right, this may happen only in the street once a year. But if you know what the impact of learning is on our students to take care of these simulated realistic environments, it's tremendous, much more definitely than attending lectures. Here it is some of the new technologies. These are expensive technologies, you know, not necessarily cheap to have these new wonderful ultrasound simulators or these virtual haptic devices for dentistry. We know that slowly but surely we'll get there learning, you know, being cautious about it, but really trying to adapt some of these technologies because some of them are really wonderful teaching tools that are coming to, to the schools. And as we move, move away from traditional practices, as we move away from many wet labs that used to occupy our campuses, we will have more chances of acquiring and using these technologies. And we're moving into this. No surprise, many of the things happening in virtual reality are happening in healthcare and are happening in health education. And you guess it right, we wanna be first. 
We want to be the first ones to introduce this technology, to use virtual patients, to use these visors for virtual reality, to get our students immersed in this without the need for physical spaces. We will keep the wonderful labs, but our students we know are moving online. Our students will have to have these kind of tools. And we're very aware of that. We're doing the second technology review this year. We want to look at all these technologies to see which ones can we adopt quickly and really bring to our simulated environment. Here are our students in Spain doing their first dental cases, you know, when they're in the second, third semester. Amazing how they react. And we put our specialists and experts in the simulators and they say, it's really a real patient. So let's, let's continue to advance with these technologies. But the most important part, the discussion, the debriefing, the soft skills, the critical thinking, this is simulation at its best. You know, the scenario is finished. The professors and the students are discussing, are learning because the plan was there. The simulation may be short, the discussion for learning will be long and will be, uh, uh, will be meaningful for these professors and students. For this to learn the development of these hard to get soft skills, leadership, teamwork, communication, problem solving, interpersonal. That's what our simulation scenarios contain and where we want our students to succeed. Let's go now into clinical and professional education. This is an opportunity to enter what we saw, you know, the, 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 the most difficult part of entering health education because it's usually outside our campuses. This clinical education needs to be of high quality, needs to be systematic, need, needs not to be random and only what happens in the clinical setting. We must plan what's happening at the clinical environment for our students to learn. We own that piece and it's not necessarily opportunistic. We need to ensure adequate exposure to a practice that fits the future real professional practice. So the volume of patients the volume of interactions, the profile of the different clients or patients need to be there. Clinical training will begin early in our programs. That's a commitment. We see it, we think it's important, and it's now part of how we design the new curriculum. We must balance the settings. We cannot rely only in the hospital. We must take the students to ambulatory settings, to community settings, to the home of the patients, to the home or the people, not necessarily a patient, so they can be more effective. As always, quality of supervision. How, what's the best role of a faculty of a preceptor in supervising? Without supervision, there is very little effectiveness in the learning. And we must provide feedback and assessment all the time. We have moved from a general hospital or tertiary care hospital for training to all these things that you see in this slide happening everywhere. This is where the patients are. So we must ensure that our curriculum consider all these spaces for clinical training. That's why we have put so much emphasis in improving our clinical and professional education at all levels. And the first thing, better planning. CPE planning, as we said, mapping. Mapping the hours, really dissecting the curriculums and saying, where do I want this student for the 100 hours? You know, what happens in the classroom? What happens in simulation? And what happens in a real external practice? And then we divide it. And our curriculums are being planned. If it's going to be in a classroom, not everything is going to be a lecture. There may be conferences, symposiums, or seminars. But we want to push for class-based, for case-based classes. We want to promote active learning. And not only specialists teaching what they have taught forever, a class on hypertension. No, we want active learning, even for clinicals. We create these clinical and professional rounds in the classroom that are really being replicated with such success with our um, professors reporting uh, great engagement and, and meaningful learning so much that it's substituting some of the clinical spaces. What's happening with this project, one of the, the wonderful projects in our academic uh, development of the model, is that our professors are saying, bring the student back to the campus, bring the student back for the, for the classroom because I want to do a professional round. 
to really help them understand the psychology student what depression means, you know. And then the simulation labs are in our campuses. So I'm seeing everywhere, you know, clinical professor asking our deans to go back to the, to the campus to do a simulation because they know that a typical medical student will see if, it's if, he, if he or she is lucky, one or two ca causes, um, cases of uh, infarction or myocardial infarction. Why? Why not make sure that the student sees two or three or four in the simulated environment and then they go to the clinical environment? And then we go to external practices. We know that we just don't send the students, that we program, that we schedule, that we talk about these technical visits, community practices, that we actually use all these resources. A student can learn so much in a school. A student can learn so much in a gym, in a restaurant, you know, everywhere that we move away from traditional settings. And therefore, we actually started the CPE methodologies, as I said, two years ago. We didn't have them. Now we have them. And this is initial package. They are part of the training. They're part of the instructor level. And what we did is, again, we didn't invent them. We went to best practices. And we just adapt them to our model. We just adapt them to different courses. You know, have we ever seen one minute preceptor or mini sex in our occupational therapy uh, courses? No, we brought it from nursing or from medicine. You know, have we seen OSCE or OSPI being done in nutrition? No, what most of our schools are doing it now. Intervention project. What does it mean to send a student to do uh, an exploratory practice in the community. What would they learn? You know, how would they review a case or do a literature case in a way that is systematic so they can learn more? How would they do a, a, a procedure? How do we monitor and supervise that? DOCS, direct observation of procedures, is a technique to ensure the student actually learn when he's doing a procedure for the first time in a clinic with a real patient. So is the one minute preceptor, wonderful technique, uh, where, where the student will receive feedback in one minute, because it's one of the main complaints of our clinical faculty. They say, well, I don't have time for the students. Well, we want to show you how in one minute you will actually, mm, you know, teach something to the student. And this is very, very effective. You know, this applies to everything you know i've seen some of our social work schools you know doing amazing with the professional rounds with a good case review with applying all this and you actually will be amazed at what we're seeing in physical education or in social work in terms of simulation incredible really good practices finally we have that piece of the model that is called strong external links this is basically about the next step for our students and this is about connecting with the future employers with the key industries with the people that will actually tell us you're not graduating the right health profession this idea of saying let's get closer to the systems of care to the systems of you know of protection of prevention where actually we'll get feedback and create a better professional so this this makes relevant internships, relevant extracurricular activities, good external practices, and basically focusing in better jobs for our graduates. So whether it's a hospital again, a farm, whether they're working in a lab because they're going to be scientists, you know, some of our biomedical students, some of our um, students in pharmacy that end up doing quality control. If they don't have that connection, without links, if they're not strong, we will be in a disadvantage competing for the best jobs. Social action. You know, I wouldn't uh, uh, think that our learning model will be complete without the incredible, incredible contribution of our clinics. We have over 60 educational clinic or service facilities. You know, we provided over a million clinical services last year, you know, we treat 250,000 patients free or very low cost. And now we're working in safety and security, you know, 
This is, these are wonderful spaces for learning. You need to actually be efficient and only create what's necessary because some of them are better to be contracted or will be too expensive and not really on the business of building or buying hospitals. But we will have some clinics and actually some of the community work that we do in the community, you know, for projects, you know, where we have a student from psychology, from social work, from nutrition, going together to take care of families and doing really what's here for good as part of our social action and definitely a part of our learning model. So can we move into this? Can we, can we actually graduate a health professional? A health professional that has all these things in mind that are really the determinants of health, you know, that thinks about the mental health of the patient, that thinks that that patient is desperate because he has a chronic condition and is using all sorts of remedies and wants to make sure that they are safe and they're good and they're helping, that is actually eating well. There is so much we can help with good nutrition of people, you know, how much we can avoid. Prevention is more than vaccines. Prevention is an app in our phone that helps us do meditation, that helps us do better sleep, that helps us do eat better and have physical activity. You know, what are we going to do with the aging of the population? How are we going to create a health professional? Doesn't need to be a geriatrician or could be or a geriatric nurse. Anybody will have to be good at dealing with people uh, in the aged care space. You know, people in the 70s and 80s that again, as I said, not necessarily sick. This may be a person that wants to go and go back and play tennis again. How can we help this? How our physical therapists can help to get these people functional? You know, and the tremendous role of community and family support, physical activity. This is real health. This is real health. Healthcare is a small piece. So if we don't do this, we won't have a good health professional. We must become proud of a professional that speaks this language, that talks this language, that actually intervenes and works with this and not only prescribing medication, doing therapy, doing massage, doing whatever is done in the traditional setting, but it's actually focused on more prevention and wellness as we're intending with academic model. So this is a summary of our academic model. This is a summary of what we've done to create this that hopefully will contribute to the future. We have over a quarter million students you know, a quarter million students were responsible for 100,000 every year that go out and become health professionals or health workers, health technicians. We absolutely are responsible for that. We feel very good uh, of what we're doing, but we must continue to advance our model. I always love our references, and I have this wonderful reference of uh, an amazing human being, um, Clara Barton, who founded the, the Red Cross in, in the U.S., and actually um, was uh, described her occupation as teacher, nurse, and humanitarian. So what best can reflect what we do in our schools? You know, and her thinking is just truly amazing and visionary. It said, it irritates me to be told how things have always been done. I defy the tyranny of precedent. I cannot afford the luxury of a closed mind. And that's what we've been asking our new institutions as they join, you know, just open your mind, let us work with you in this academic model. It works because we've seen it. We have our results now of several years. We were questioning the beginning. We were actually forced to become traditional. We were actually demanded to be traditional and conventional. We said, no, we're gonna defy this tyranny of precedent and we're gonna move to an innovative model. And today we've been copied by others. We've been replicated by others. We're very proud of that. We're not really unhappy that people are doing what we're doing because at the end, we think this wonderful outcome is what's important. You know, we are preparing students to take care of lives. And I've shared with some of my colleagues uh, how much I like this picture because it shows that even in a similar environment, our students are tremendously engaged and amazing if you see those two students don't have a caring attitude. I don't know what a caring attitude is. The baby is a simulator 
but what they're doing is really preparing themselves to take care of lives. And that's what the Lord learning model allows us and really let us do this thing. So I'm gonna um, open up for a few questions and see if in, the, in our system uh, here we have uh, any, any questions or, or I see a very active chat now, you know, I know Manuela and Vivian have been helping, you know, and this is uh, the opportunity of, uh, of, uh, of being live. You know, we will have this, this, um, this webinar available for the future with the same link. But I think, uh, I think Vivian, Natalie, thank you for your participation. We're so looking forward to the, the work in Australia, you know, and, and Jane, thank you, Ashley, all them for their, their contributions and their interactions during, during the chat today. So I think I'm just gonna uh, then go ahead and share the screen again so you can uh, actually access our uh, registration form where we want a little bit of feedback. You know, this is a simple tool, not uh, before reminding you to please find and follow us in the Instagram. Here's the reference. You know, we're sharing a lot of the pictures. It was wonderful how the file is actually uh, seeing all the teams being uh, sharing some of the, uh, the presentations. So continue to follow us and share uh, uh, our work in Instagram. It's been great. We're over a thousand now followers. Tremendous work. So in order to, to access the link, just point your camera and your phone to this QR code, and it should ask you to open a, a browser, a Safari or, or the other one, or, or, or any of the Android browsers that will let you uh, answer a few questions and your registration will, will be captured. If you have problem problems with the QR code, just please um, access that link that is uh, written uh, in the bottom, and you will be able to access this. If you are accessing this webinar at a future day, you can still fill this form, so please do that, so we can know of your participation and also know our wonderful Instagram. So again, thank you. Thank you to the teams that accompany live this webinar. We're looking forward to work with you in so many good things. And I'm really uh, very, very happy uh, that we had this opportunity. Thank you for your time. Have a great day and we'll see you around. Thank you.